see. Uh, good morning, everyone. And this is the seventh meeting of the CHAP on phthalates. And uh, hopefully it's lucky seven. And uh, this more, uh, just a reminder that today, uh, today's meeting is open to the public. It's being webcast and recorded. And I would just like to remind the, all the speakers to use your microphone so that the people in the room and, and the people listening in can hear. In about, in about an hour, uh, Lisa will be down for the lunch orders. Couldn't, if I broke up the actual body of the report, we'd have, wouldn't have fit, so. Yep, that's fine. There's a, there is a contents just inside that first page. Are you ready? Russ, are you up? Chris, are you ready? Andreas, over. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Welcome all the chat members again. Thank you all for making the, the trip. Some of you from long distances. What I'd like to do today is begin to uh, finalize our, our document. I think there are some sections, hopefully, that we can do that. Um, what I'd like to do, is, Chris, is start with your section. And um, Mike, if we can bring that section up on the, on the screen, so that'd be section 2F, hazard okay. index approach. And the strategy for uh, today is to, to go through um, Section 2F, then 2E, the human biomonitoring, 2G, the scenario-based aggregate phthalate exposure assessment, which should lead us into then Section 5, the criteria, and Section 5B, the recommendations. Okay. So the, the idea is to see if we can get through the recommendations and, and finalize those. Tomorrow, we will go back and look at other sections of the, uh, the short report. So, uh, Chris, you want to lead the discussion on, on your section, and now is the time to uh, bring up any uh, additions, corrections, uh, and, and the idea is at the end of this discussion, we will have uh, this section ready to go to the reviewers. Chris? So is that, oh, that is on, okay. Um, I haven't edited this since our phone call. Um, weeks back, um, but largely you'll see um, the section may be a little bit redundant in the sense of trying to start with the choice of the approach for quantitative risk assessment. I think that's largely going to be dealt with earlier, but um, I think just to set it, um, I thought just a couple paragraphs would be fine there um, on page 37. Um, as way of an, an introduction to what to the hazard index um, see at the bottom of page 37 the definition of hazard quotient which is then used in the hazard index because the figures now include hazard quotients which will be so that just helps that definition 
um, all of the exposure part has been moved to you know the Holger section. So this is largely just sort of setting up. Um, you know, we're, the reason why we're using the hazard index. Here's the hazard index, and then what data we're using it on. Um, so on page 38, the NHANES and the study for future families. Um, and then the next section, summary description of methods used, is just, um, you know, what chemicals um, are in the analysis, and then the three choices, um, the reference doses, the description that moves on to page 39, the, the uh, three cases. And then the method section ends with the definition on page 39 of the um, margin of exposure. And the rest of the section is largely just trying to, you know, summarizing what was done. Um, so a lot of the figures and things. Oh, I guess one thing that to point out is um, we are using now the um, uh, sampling weights in the NHANES data. So the inference then can be based on, you know, the U.S. non-institutionalized, um, well, population, but we're focusing on the uh, uh, age range for reproducible, you know, for um, reproductive age. That's for the NHANES. I'm not sure what else. I know, under case one, you have highlighted um, other reasons. Do we want to you know, either supply other reasons or delete that? That was actually addressing, uh, there was a question, I think some of the, somebody internally reviewed it, I thought, and, and asked the question of why did you use Court and Camp and Faust instead of other papers. I don't really know why we use Court and Camp and Faust except, I mean, honestly, Andreas um, presented that to us at one of our earlier meetings and it just seemed like a, it included so much of what we were interested in. It, you know, why not? There, it really wasn't a comparison of you know, their evaluation versus somebody else's. Um, is that an important question for us to sort of nail down? Are there other possibilities that we could have used? I don't think there are, are there? Are there other data sets? Within your bias. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was certainly a recent paper. There is a Benson paper. I haven't looked at the comparison um, of the two. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Maybe Benson, Benson should be mentioned here, but there, there's no contradiction because both Benson and Cotton Camp and Faust used the um, used the cumulative risk assessment method based on the assumption of dose addition. So, but for the sake of uh, completeness, I think we should mention Benson at our, no, Benson, single author paper. But, but I don't think we can, you know, we can't compare all possible papers. So I, no. there, there, it, maybe Benson, maybe I'll look back at Benson and see how it compares to Court and Camp and Faust in terms of there, chemicals. There are, there are differences in the outcomes, but there's, there's uh, <clears throat> unanimity in terms of what approach to use. I think the, the latter is the more important thing here. Andreas, you mentioned that in your section, didn't you? Did you not, their paper, the Benson approach, or the Benson paper? No, I have to check again. My, my section was mainly concerned with going through the experimental evidence, not... Um, okay. May I make a suggestion here? That's sort of for... It's a little thing, but just to make this clearer, uh, right at the beginning of page 37 that we distinguish very clearly between those methods, uh, concepts, dose addition and independent action, 
as concepts for the evaluation of experimental data as opposed to their use in cumulative risk assessment. So this distinction is made between the assessment on these concepts in assessing experimental data and uh, their use as methods for cumulative risk assessment. For example, hazard index approach is one. One of these cumulative risk assessment approaches based on those additions. And there are, this distinction is important because the cumulative risk assessment approaches make some uh, simplifying assumptions in comparison to when these concepts are used in the evaluation of experimental data. Maybe that uh, could, I mean, it needs a sentence or two to distinguish that and make that clear. What are you talking about for the second paragraph? <clears throat> yeah. Let's, let's, put some, easily, let's put some words to that right now. Yeah, give, give me five minutes and uh, you carry on, give me five minutes and then I'll, we'll get okay. back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just uh, more of a clarification that there's the three cases, Chris. Um, in reading through it, I, I couldn't really distill down what were the the main differences between the case? I mean, is there a way to bullet or describe it better or or maybe on a paragraph saying how they differ in, in terms of, um, I guess, assumptions and how that would lead to maybe differences in calculations? It, yeah, it's a good point. It's sort of a summary of the motivation of the three. Um, and it's hard to distinguish the differences between them, you know, based on what's what's written so far, at least for me. The differences yeah. in the motivation or the differences in the values? <clears throat> the, the, motivation. the motivation, yeah. Why, why are they three? I think I, maybe Holger could input there as well, but um, my thinking on that is the, the case one is, is published, you know, reference dose is published approach it's just sort of based on what's in the literature um, with a little bit of variation because we added um, DINP and DIDP or I'm, I think DIDP to what you did um, case two and I think the distinction is case one largely is looking at um, selecting a reference dose per chemical um, not sort of relative to each other but I think the neat thing about case two um, Holger's, it was actually Holger's idea to, to actually think about these as equipotent chemicals, which was a work or, or comments that um, Earl Gray has made. And then with those assumptions, that really is sort of a comparison across chemicals, not just one at a time. Um, so it's more of a set an evaluation. Um, so I think case two sort of has that flavor. And then case three is largely just representing all the work that the committee's done um, in terms of selecting reference doses. So I agree with you. I can try to write something that says um, we chose three cases largely because we wanted to see the impact of different values on the analysis um, and then maybe motivate what they are and then say them. Is that, yes. is that what you're yeah. thinking? Yeah. And especially case three, there's, there's not a lot. That, but I, I, after you motivate them and des describe them, I mean, very briefly, I would say, would would it, um, I mean, then you're going to get results for the different cases. Do you then conclude that one is more appropriate? No, I think, not? I think largely they, they are sort present. of in agreement um, okay. qualitatively uh, what the results are, um, which I think is an important point to say it doesn't matter too much which of the cases you choose. It says in all cases studied, the hazard index value was dominated by DEHP. Okay. 
No, not three different methods. The, the, the methods cases the are just different reference doses. Well, I think because there was a rationale behind choosing these three different cases, there is no problem in, in giving the arguments to it. And uh, oh, as, yeah, as Chris pointed out, uh, we were motivated by several reasons to do this three-case approach. Uh, one of them also was Tom Burke's presentation when he said we, we have to give an idea of the uncertainty of the data. And uh, we all know that if, for example, if we have a look at the reference dose for DHP, which is based on a study from 1954, that we have to have a look at more recent data, and uh, this is kind of reflected in this uh, approach here of the three different cases. Yeah, we have to put it in perfect right. That was lost in the. Okay, but we, we need to capture this right now um, because if we go away from the table, we're going to forget this. Um, so, um, let's start doing that. We've got the time. Uh, so, what's the process? Who's going to do the edits and? Mike is going to do I, the I do edits it. on what's up on the screen. Right now. Okay. May, may I? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> yeah. Uh, may I make a suggestion? Maybe uh, should we um, collect the points for this section and then have a big bit of a break, give drafting assignments to members of the panel, and then reconvene in half an hour after the break? How's that? Is that a suggestion? I mean, I've got notes for three areas that want to be revised. Can be. Upgrade. Yeah, rather than go into the detail and to find, um, you know, the worth smithing detail here now, why don't we collect the issue, go for a break, implement it, reconvene, and then look at the product? I agree because yeah. I think so, that will save a lot of time. Yeah. So what? But do we do like? Do I make edits and then email them to Mike? Yeah. To put yeah. back together Mike or? Mike has the master. He can. Whatever's whatever's easiest. Okay, I think that's fine. Instead of. Otherwise, you're going to, it's going to be hard. Maybe if you, Holger, your last comment was important too, in terms of also that captured. Yeah, and how, how did you capture that Holger's point, Chris? Well, why don't we go that's, offline that's, and let them work? We will do this together. Okay. And I wanted to make a point about case three. Uh, I think we ought to have included in the rationale there that we did that in response to the charge that we do a de novo analysis. That is perfect. That puts case three into a, a very different light. Yeah. Are we interested in actually doing a comparison of the reference doses across the three? Do we need to discuss that, or is it just a matter of showing it? I mean, I don't, it again, it's a space issue. My thinking was we were going to make this a short section, but if we if we want to go on and on, we could actually say, well, the EHP was chosen by, you know. Well, there, I, I think it's in the, uh, is it all in the appendix? Mm -hmm. The table. Isn't the table here? No, I guess it's in the appendix. Yeah. Um, but my point was, do we need to actually discuss? Let me back away. What I was trying, I think the, the value of the three cases is we don't have to sweat which of the values, you know, which of the reference doses for each chemical is the best. We're trying to see in the variability of the reference doses, do we have a, a significant change in 
in the uh, outcome, and we don't. So I don't think we need to say too much about a head-to-head -head comparison of why one reference dose may be better than the other, or, right? Not the comparison, but the rationale for choosing the three cases. The rationale. We yeah. can do this in three sentences. Yeah. That's no problem. We're talking only about paragraph to, to tie things together in the beginning, you know, 200 words. And then and the conclusions, 12 words. That's what we need. Okay, Paul, what are you saying now? You're saying we need to add something to the conclusion as written? Yeah. Paul's statement about, you know, the conclusion with respect to cases. Why? Yes, adding something almost to like what Chris just said, you know, basically that, you know, although Cases differed, reference doses, et cetera. The you know bottom line result was oh, yeah. similar. Yeah, I think I mean, that's, you, Chris okay. said it much better, but some, something like that, just so okay. it's, it's clear. I just had a question about process. So if we're reviewing Chris and Holger's section in the short report, should we at the same time look through the what's in the appendix or leave that no. separate okay. and not? <coughs> Discuss it. Overkill. Yeah, I mean, maybe not now, but I we need to make sure that that there are no inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can probably do between the time we leave here and the time the report is submitted, and, and the person who has written the appendix can do that and make sure they're mm -hmm. those two mm -hmm. go together it's sort of what you're asking to do is sort of exactly what we did with the exposure chapter the whole appendix we reviewed about three and a half weeks ago and that's why we came up with some changes in numbers because we realized some things that were in there were very very old and we wanted to replace them with things that are new and and then try to come up with a level of consistency. So what you're just talking about, I think, is, is perfectly reasonable, but not, not for now. Okay, any other comments for Chris on Section 2F? Okay, so during the break they will compose corrections that we will then look at after the break. Okay, and then we will move on to Holger's section. We probably could have done this one first, but I don't know why I did that second. Yeah, it's the alphabet. I don't know the alphabet. Um, <laughs> Is that it? Ladies first, okay. Now I just have to find the beginning of Holger's section. There it is. Down on page 26 on the bottom. Yeah, so Chris and me drafted this section mainly for four reasons. First, it was a de novo approach to analyze the exposure in five different populations. That's a, the two enhanced populations, women and pregnant women, and three population subsets from the SFF study, study for future families. That's the pre- and postnatal women exposure, and there we have a data set also on the exposure of infants from month zero to 37. So with this uh, data investigation, we uh, could compare the data with each other. We could compare this data set with previous published data sets from the US, but also from other studies worldwide. We could have a look at the correlations between the metabolites within each population. And, and that's a very 
important step for the end. We could compare this data with the aggregate exposure data from Paul's and the Versa approach, which of course is not yet finished because we just got the last data in a couple of days ago. And with this approach then we could pave the way for the, for the hazard quotient approach, the individual uh, risk assessment approach and the hazard index approach, the cumulative risk assessment approach which has already been presented by Chris. <coughs>
Yeah, okay. okay. That's that's my point. That's the only thing that has to be yeah. asked. Because we just got that. Are you there? Okay. Um, this gets back to something that I think Russ published. Um, not exactly that. Um, so in Table Five on page thirty-six, these are these. I, I looked at it too quickly a minute ago. These are actually correlations of prenatal versus postnatal, and I think that's important in just the fact that this is spot urine, um, and you know, on the same women, but from different points in time. Down the diagonal, they are you know correlations of the of the. Um, chemical by with itself, but at two different points in time. And I think Russ has published analyses of, you know, multiple spot urines over time, and you end up being able to say, even though, I think your conclusion on some of your papers was, you know, that spot urines are useful in epidemiology studies to track exposures and classifying, yeah. So we're seeing that again. So maybe that would be an important point, just to bolster the idea that it there are limitations to the spot urine, but there is some, I don't know if validation is the word or something because of what we're seeing here. And one observation is when you look across the diagonal in table five, apart from the dibutyl, all the other correlations are very similar. Which you know, you would you would think if there are different prenatal, postnatal sources, you know, that some may be closer to zero, some may be closer to 0 0.5, 0 0.3, but all of them are around 0.3 or so, which is I think interesting. You know, basically telling us that irregardless of whether you're talking about DEP or DEHP, there's similar correlations in strength. Low correlation. They're low, but, um, but more similar to each other, right. given that there's such different sources. You know, for DEP, the sources are so different than for DEHP, but the well, correlations are nearly identical, really. But I think they're the moderate one, to weak. The one thing that we're missing in time, the time between when the exposure occurs and the time when it shows up in the urine or in, you know, anything because of the fact that it's don't know did exposure occur on day X or day Y or day Z for all these different compounds. And the fact what you're seeing here may be the residual correlation because there's a low level of constant input into the bodily fluids from phthalates. And this is the baseline correlation, which is about 9% of the variance. But if you wanted to go any farther, you have to link back these levels that are in the urine to the point in time when it occurred and then figure out how to establish a time course between exposure and dose. That is what is missing here is the time because it only, biomarkers only give you, as you say, an instant time. If it's a 24-hour, even if it's a 24-hour sample, it's only 24-hour sample for that period of time backwards from when the exposure occurred and what remains. So it's, it's, not, it's not a simple not simple analysis. There are a lot of issues with respect to time that one has to take in consideration, but this may be the baseline. You know, over time, this is what you see as variance that's due to what stays in the body over a regular, over during a person's uh, month in a life, year in a life. You know, I, I, I agree completely. Um, what I was just struck me as being odd was DEP, which is coming more likely from personal care products, has a similar correlation between the mother and the infant, as does DHP, which is primarily coming from diet. And you know. But think, a mother, you eat every day, and the mother uses their personal products every day. And so therefore, there's a constant baseline there, and it's the fact that there are no peaks, which indicate that, you know, there's really a lot of issues on elimination and, and uh, transformation that are not understood, Met metabolism is not understood. Think of it, you know, over time people have a really regular pattern of use, but those patterns of use go all over the place. Yeah. 
Can, can I just point out that there's funny, something funny in the heading for this table? Uh, shouldn't it read Pearson collation estimates for estimated daily intake values in mothers or of mothers? I don't know. There, there's something funny in that heading. And, and I stand corrected. It, it's not prenatal and postnatal, it's postnatal and baby. We had other tables that were pre and post. It's IP prenatal. It is postnatal and with the infant, right. There were different categories. I didn't, I didn't know which one was. I read it too fast. So, yeah, but, so you're right. We could say for estimated daily intake values in, in mothers. For postnatal values, does postnatal imply mothers? Like mothers? Maternal. <laughs> Maternal values? <coughs> postnatal. Yeah. Okay, good. And I'd like to make a point to what Paul was just saying because you used the word missing. Do we want to capture what you just said in terms of? The, the section we have yet to write completely, the missing data part, do we want to talk about that? I'm writing that right now. Okay, thank you. And then you certainty later on for the second time. Uh, Paul, what, what, in your opinion, what do we make out of the correlations between the set of the high molecular weight phthalates and the low molecular weight phthalates? So in a way, it means that those who are exposed to one high molecular weight phthalate are, with certain variability, also yeah. exposed to the other high molecular weight phthalates. Yeah, I think that's about all you can say. So we have to assume with, a, with some certainty that those who are exposed to highly to one high molecular weight phthalate are also higher exposed to other high, high molecular Which weight phthalates. It's probably very common because these things are in everything. Not dealing with a unique source, which would, if it was a unique source, we'd see a spike somewhere. Some compound would be way out of whack with everything else. Not, that's why you're seeing this you know, low level. But I think this might also be of importance for both the, the cumulative hazard index approach and also for the, let's say, worst case approach from your side that we add up the 95th percentiles from the aggregate exposures so because with some rationale behind it because we can say that the ones that are higher exposed to one high molecular weight phthalate are also higher exposed yeah. to the other one that's fair that's a fair Any other comments for Holger? No. Okay. Russ? No? Mike, is there a, an appendix for this sec section two, Holger, or no? No, this is <coughs> it's it. In, okay. It's in here. Well, it's, I think the, um, Uh, the, it's in the hazard index section. Is there, they were combined, and we chose to leave the tables in in the main part. But we can <coughs> maybe one table take to the to the appendix. But I've heard of a lot of people here that told me that they like the numbers, <laughs> like looking at the numbers. Two, <laughs> two B. Are these uh, that ta those tables? Two A, I guess, or. Yeah, a really fine font. Maybe we could put table one into the, the appendix if, if we need to the, the conversion factors.
Mike, there isn't any additional biomonitoring data in, in tab 7, is there? <clears throat> well, I think tab, se tab 7 was a, <clears throat> you know, uh, sections uh, F and uh, E and F biomonitoring and uh, hazard index or were uh, originally one that's why there's still one appendix they were originally one document and then we split them into two parts for the short report the main body So a lot of the, there is an equivalent, yeah, well, there is a table one in tab seven, the appendix. It's a little more detailed even. Don't we need to sort of edit down the, this appendix though, basically, because so, so much of it is in both places? I'm, well, not, I'm not sure what I helped. think the it I guess the appendix is gonna be um, somewhat of a standalone thing just a longer version so it's I mean there's gonna be some redundancy In the appendix, you describe case one, two, and three with a bit more detail. I mean, I, I would almost bring some of that into the short part of the report, and then you may not need to repeat it. I mean, if that's one way of, uh, on page 14 and 15. Savings, 100%. After while I'm writing this, one of the things that becomes clear is that maybe the biomonitoring data most useful in cumulative risk assessment, but it has, can tell us nothing about the sources that can contribute to the highest or identify the populations at high risk. in which these I think my own I think I disagree with that in the sense of I think that the biomonitoring data allows representation of real exposure per person and not you know hypothetical everybody has a meeting everybody has high exposures um, so, and every, every exposure, so each woman in this case, you know, is, has her own mixture. And so you're seeing the distribution of, of how those different mixtures look across a population. So I don't think we could say we don't know anything about high exposures. <clears throat> didn't say we didn't know anything. It can't represent the high exposure are going to be many cases that when you deal with them, when you're dealing with urine values, it's, it's only going to give you a spot piece of data. Data could be at the tail end of when the exposure occurred. It could be at the beginning. 
I have no idea what the range was of where the timing of the exposure I, I, I think that's true on a, per, on a per person basis. But if you look at across a population, I think you are seeing, I mean, I think it would be reasonable to assume that there would be some women who may have just had the exposure and other women who are hours away from the exposure. But because you're looking at that distribution, you're getting that representation. But isn't that the mean? Right, the representation is you're averaging among the... I can't, you couldn't go back and say that based upon the mean value, the values we're using for our intake or for our going to be representative of the person who's either got very low or high exposure. Say that for the fact? May I interject? That's sure, a, I mean, I'm, that's I a confusion here between uh, statements for particular individuals and statements for a population. What the point to take out of this, uh, uh, home from this, in my okay. opinion, is that you're making intake estimates for entire populations. Right. I agree. So, <clears throat> as Chris said, and I'm sure Holger will agree, that is possible um, if you measure spot urine concentrations for large, pe for large groups of people. Otherwise, your reservations are, of course, totally valid. Just how we phrase it. Hmm. And your other point is also well taken and well recognized, that, and that is that on the basis of those biomonitoring data, you cannot make inferences as to the sources. That's why source root fate modeling is important. Mm -hmm. I just want to figure out exactly what this intake value represents. An average over a population. That's what I, that's yeah. what I figure. It's an average. Should that be em emphasized? I think it needs to be. I think that's limiting to say it's an average over a population. The middle of that distribution is the average of pro across the population, but there are some in that upper tail, there are people who have women who have mm. high exposures. Now, we don't know where it came from. We know it's there, and but the neat thing about the biomonitoring data is that we can see you know how these chemicals are together in the same person. We're not. We don't have to make assumptions across chemicals. That's something that we have a problem with. You know, otherwise. I'm still, still seeing how what you're saying is different than what I'm saying. When you say on, maybe I'm just reacting to when you say on the average. It makes me think that all we can interpret. Maybe that's not what you're saying. But my, I'm thinking. All we can interpret is the middle of this distribution, and I would say no. We can look at the tail of these distributions. It's the upper tail and the lower but tail. But the numbers right? that we're using define the hazard index are based upon what? A summation of the hazard index uh, for each individual? Each person is their own hazard index. Right, and then if, if that's the case, and what you're coming up with is a hazard index for that chemical? For the set of chemicals. So therefore, what are you getting? And a hazard index uh, distribution for the population. Right. And but, that, the, but that's important. That's the key point. That's right. the key point. It's a hazard index for the population, but what is the value that you're representing? When you sum this across, when we sum across doing a, when we're doing a cumulative risk assessment, are you summing the 90th percentile, the 95th percentile, the 50th no, percentile? No, see, okay. No, see, that's, so, okay, here's the important point. What's in the numerator here is actually the daily intake <laughs> estimates for each woman. So each woman is their own, has, has their own hazard index. It's not based on a population value <clears throat> of exposure. It is based on the concentrations of urine from that woman. Yeah. And that woman had multiple concentrations <clears throat> and, you know, from the different chemicals. Okay. And there, and so then those are then weighted with the appropriate reference doses and then summed up. So each woman is, has her own hazard index. So that's, I think, the really cool thing about this, which is different than what's the typical um, hazard index approach. So you're basically using all of the values rather than <clears throat> a median or a 95th percentile or you're right. using each value for each right. woman. Yeah. So if that hasn't come out, that's the big point, right? Holy that hasn't if that come hasn't out. come out, then that, we need to really yeah. that hasn't come out. That's <laughs> to like demonstrate the calculation or do something very basic to oh, get that to really clear. You explain it.
figure out where it has Can we go back to the 2F in a second? Okay. On page 28, you do say that. But I, I had took a while to get to it. It's there. On page 28. Under dose extrapolation. Yeah, this paragraph could probably be raised better. But, but it, clearer. Is, it is there. It is there, yeah. yeah but but I, it took a while for me to. But yeah. should it be in that section or back in the. 2F. <clears throat> yeah. Um, it, it is something I drafted, but it should rather be in, in, in Chris' section. 2F, where is that? What page? Yeah. Well, that's afterwards. I'm telling you, this is. But the hazard text serves up later. The Holger section is the exposure section. Is but the I, but I think that maybe, I think what Andreas and I are probably saying is that it needs to be stated here and then it needs to be stated, restated <laughs> again. Mm -hmm. Because if it's stayed here a little bit more clearly, then when you go later on, you feel more comfortable. Because this is where it's calculated, right? Where the calculation is done. This is when the daily intakes are estimated, right. but it doesn't, it's not summed or anything in this no, section. No, no, but this is, but you, but the, the whole point of what you just laid to me was that the point about the fact that this is where the daily intake is calculated and it's a distribution. So maybe just a little bit clearer. Again, two sentences saying at the beginning that, you know, this is how we did it, just exactly as you described it to me. That makes things clearer. But, but that indeed is the difference between Chris' approach and mine in, in the way we present the data. If you look into my tables, the 95th percentile for one phthalate is not the same as the 95th percentile for the other in terms of it's another woman. It, could, it, it is not the same person who has the 95th percentile there and there. While in Chris' approach, the 95th percentile is the cumulative exposure of all the exposures for the individual woman. So it could co be a maximum exposure for one phthalate and the 50 percentile for another phthalate and the 25th percentile for the others. So that that's... Now you just confused me. Sorry. Well, because so, Holker's I, looking at individual phthalates <sighs> in his section and Chris is doing the cumulative part. Right. So I think what Holger's point is, the 90, there is a woman, there is a woman right. who has the, at the 95th level, 95th right. percentile level, and in terms of hazard index, mm -hmm. right, by taking a multiple, you know, a multivariate distribution, putting it down to one index, you can see, you know, it's only one dimensional then, right? Mm -hmm. So that's different than on Holger's table where when you look at 95th percentile of one chemical and 95th percentile of the second chemical, that's not the same person. No, we should, wouldn't be. That's what the correlation matrix is saying, too. It ain't. Because otherwise there would be a much higher correlation. If the, if the 95th percentile and the 75th and the 50th are all the same for each, for every woman had the same one, well, then the correlations would be much higher. Scatter indicates that the 95th for A, B, or C is distributed among other women. That's what makes the correlations low, because you don't know what the sources are. You don't know the time course of the sources to when you see the expression of the compound or metabolite in the urine. Makes sense why we're seeing 0 0.3, 0 0.4.
And we'll see the scatter plot. Well, Holger and Chris, do you think you can come up with text that will clarify the, the two sections? Yes. <laughs> I was kind of expecting I'm confident. to say no. <laughs> We're up for the task. Something that, that Paul and I can understand. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, <laughs> our, our limited ability to bars to the trees. No, actually, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get it to the public because we're going to have to explain this to a series of people who are going to have to make recommendations and have to understand this beyond what we can as scientists. Without those kinds of pieces of information, hard for people to wade through this kind of detailed analysis, especially when the data sources are so, so different and sometimes disparate. Yeah, let's do that. Holger, here's some, con here's, here's this is probably a good time to take a break and, and do some writing and we'll come back in uh, at 11 o'clock. That's for this. Okay. Um, well, if you want to do your whole section, that that's fine. Uh, edit. Either edit your section would be. <clears throat> well, it dep I guess it depends on how much stuff there is. If it's. Um, if you're scattered around, if you could send me your section otherwise, send me a paragraph just so I know where to insert it. Is that perfectly clear? <laughs> Mike, while you're doing that, I think maybe we'll go on and talk about uh, Paul's section, okay. which we can do from our hard copy. Okay. Okay, so if, if the chap would turn to their page 43. Yes. Were you making some changes with Mike? Well, yes. Yeah. You want to talk about those? What? Well, they were mo there? mostly additions. Okay. Because we have to put some framing around the non-phthalate substitutes. Okay. So that. So that's primarily what 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 is what we've done is added some text to the introduction, to the results and whatever to into the conclusions dealing with that particular issue, those, that particular issue. Um, we also, I'm also adding text, I also add text for the table that was given us yesterday on, um, you know, like the comparison between the intakes that we uh, calculated by estimating exposure versus what has been seen in the, the actual studies. And the primary result there is that, you know, the, the results are within a factor of one order of magnitude, which considering the estimations and the, the way in which biomonitoring results are obtained, spot samples, which is not too bad considering a first, a first shot. But if we want to improve that, we've got to get more data. And I think that's, that's the summary of what we're saying there in terms of the, the value and the use of the data can be um, for a risk assessment, but with the qualifiers that there are uncertainties, and uncertainties in terms of unknowns because no one takes the data. No one gets the work done. You know, we, we hear a lot of complaints about the lack of real exposure data. Well, 
that's not the fault of the chap, it's the fault of the community not doing the work. And I think uh, the more we remain in uncertain, the harder it is for us to um, reduce those uncertainties in a, in a timely way. So that's one of the points I've made in terms of um, uh, the chapter. I think we've done pretty well considering the limitations that are associated with the data sets. And, and it does frost me that um, we don't have enough exposure data. Beautiful voice there, nice and clearly to understand. Do you, do you think I'm an okay now? Yeah, uh, yeah. My Mick Jagger approach is going to work? Very well, very All nice. right. It, it suits you so well. <laughs> Anyway, back to seriousness. Yes. I think that's that's where we are right now, and I think that's the best we can do. And I think what M Mike is doing, he's making going to be making changes, and um, that additional table I think is valuable for the cumulative risk assessment that's going to be done later on, so it can be referred back to uh, in the report. In addition, just to let you know, as I did write an uncertainty <coughs> uncertainty section. Yep. Uh, and I think it lays out some of the critical issues that need to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And um, from the standpoint of the non-phthalate substitutes, um, again, the, the cry is for data. Because what we're doing right now is we're just working on one route of entry, that's uh, non-dietary ingestion from um, you know, teethers and uh, soft toys that people can suck on. And that's insufficient to make a conclusion, draw any conclusions about exposure. And especially term cumulative exposure, we can't make, we, we haven't got prayer making any uh, comparisons because we don't know how the non-phthalate substitutes would compare in terms of just which sources they would be in, how they bind to those sources, and things of that sort, and the nature of the frequency of the contact <coughs> of kids with them. Okay? But we are progressing toward an end. And uh, we should have, by the end of today or tomorrow, text to uh, match the comments that I just gave you. Okay. Any comments from chat members? Are we set on this order being biomonitoring um, data, the hazard index, and then this section? Um, yeah, I think so, because that's real data. You know, at least you have something to hang your hat on. I mean, we're making estimates. They're good estimates, as best as you can make with the data we have available. But the bio, bio monitoring, I think, sets a tone that it's real data. And it's a lot easier to start interpreting from real data in comparison to uh, the quote, quote, the hypothetical that's based upon a lot of indirect information. So should that sort of be a, pre a preamble to this section describing I mean, I just, I'm looking at the page prior to this as, you know, margin of exposure estimates, and then we go straight into hair products and toys. It, I mean, maybe there needs to be a transition. Give me, give now, me an idea how's where you the want. reader supposed to read this? It, is it relative to what they've just read in terms of biomonitoring? Is it, uh, what's the objective? Um, So what do you say, Chris? Do you want to have the, the hazard index approach after after this? No, I, I, I don't know. I, I, any order is, I think this order is fine. I just think there needs to be more of a transition between where we are with biomonitoring data and, and the beginning of this. I mean, do we just yeah. need to have a little, I don't know if, it, if I, it's. I would like to support that idea. I think the, the um, Scenario-based exposures in G should either be before or after E, the biomonitoring, and then then the way is paved for dealing with F hazard index. Yeah, I think before might be a reasonable way to yeah, go. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think yeah. before the hazard index That's would right. Be fine. But the, Say yeah, between, right, af uh, uh, right what after biomonitoring would probably be wise because then, yeah, that's then what you I don't said. have this disconnect. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Totally yeah. agree with that. I thought that's what we agreed to the last time. Maybe we maybe I was out of the room. I think oh well. <laughs> I, I was out of the room. Maybe. I thought we had it that way and I suggested changing it. I don't know. <laughs> You're now, to blame. Now wait, but what was just suggested and what you just said I think were two different things. Why? Because we I think we just suggested that 
your section go before biomonitoring? Mm -hmm. Before hazard, but after biomonitoring, because biomonitoring is the real data. But I think biomonitoring needs to go right before hazard index, doesn't it? Because those are really tied together. Then the alternative would be to put polled stuff before biomonitoring, then biomonitoring, then hazard index. That's what I thought. That could be that's, done too. That's what I yeah. thought. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the most reasonable Actually, way. think, but, okay, but the only difference will be that in our section now, we include this new table that actually compares the biomonitoring data to the exposure calculated data. If that's okay with you, we're fine. No, no problem. It can be taken out and then put, say, at the end of biomonitoring in a special section. Didn't okay, you, you that would be that section? actually would be good. Take that. Take the text that I just wrote up, which is fine, and take the table, and then put that at the end of the biomonitoring, and that solves both of your problems and say how to link it together. So the text I just gave you. It be, instead of being at the end of the results for this section, take it at the end of the results for the biomonitoring section for comparative analysis with the estimate exposures. I'm okay with that. Yeah, that's, that would uh, then pave the way for the analysis with hazard index, etc. Perfect. And, mm -hmm. and plus, I think there's a real novelty, and the striking thing is, and I've never seen that in that clarity elsewhere, that both broadly speaking, exposure assessment methods yield comparable results. Yeah. Okay. No, that's perfectly reasonable. In fact, that makes a, that makes a, con makes a nice consistent flow mm -hmm. by taking that one section out and moving it. Okay. I'm easy. It's already been written. Okay. So we want to have biomonitoring then the exposure. No, no exposure, exposure first. Exposure, then my biomonitoring, and then had exposure, biomonitoring, hazard index. And then the one table which we were going to add to exposure, put the end of biomonitoring with the text that I just wrote for that table, transferred also. Okay? Okay. Got it? And there are some grammatical problems I had with some of the text that I'll point out to you that I, I couldn't make sense of a couple sentences, so I'll point okay. this out to you. That's fine. I probably wrote it in my sleep. Yeah. So I used to do my mathematics problems many years ago. Well, it's like they were written by a left-handed person. <laughs> you got it. All right, but um, seriously, I think I think this sounds a lot better for how we want to establish the basis for which to, I think, do the risk assessment in the end if we go each one of those. And actually what it does also, in thinking about it, it does lay the foundation, which we explain in the text, that the phthalates and toys are a small part of the overall exposure. So saying that first, then going to biomonitoring and then going to hazard index at least lays a foundation as to what we're dealing with in terms of the percent contribution of the phthalates and toys to the overall process, which is explained in that section. So yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Mike, you will ship those around for us? Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, anyway, this is... Okay, go I'm not back. sure which exactly where the changes are, but this yeah. is. You want to point those out, Chris? Well, before we do that, though, so um, I'm just thinking about what we talked about with the expo with the biomonitoring um, data. Uh, we had a discussion, I think, added at the end about um, correlations, yeah. and now we're saying at the end of that, we're going to put a comparison of a table that has a comparison of. Uh, means or whatever point estimates um, across the biomonitoring data and mm -hmm. the exposure modeling, right? Mm -hmm. That's the reason. Do we need to say something about um, so there's going to be similar point estimates within orders of magnitude, mm -hmm. whatever? Do we need to say something about correlations that that or is that going too far? Didn't we say we couldn't really go? 
that far with the biomonitor. We, with the, we, um, we can't exposure. talk about the sources. That's the key addition to that correlation is we can't talk about the sources because of the issues of space, time, and, you know, not everybody who's high is high with the same chemicals. So therefore, I think it works, and I think. Is that in the? Is that in what you wrote, Holger? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I put that down there. There was an addition that Holger and I worked on. Okay. Sorry. Right. I so, I so it it is there, and then we can go on to that, saying, actually, you can add, even with these, maybe add a, a connecting set, even with these issues. All right, for the results we have, this is what we found in Table X, that there is comparability. Or at least some of the some of the, uh, the work. Mainly, mainly it's the average where there's comparability, because not everybody did the um, the 95th percentile. We, so we can pardon me. That's what we. Yeah, that's the addition. I mean, is there any value in calculating hazard indices for the? Scenario exposures. I mean, it can be done. What do you mean? Just well, scenario. just as you calculated a hazard index for the biomonitoring data, you can do it for the exposure assessment data too. You want to add that? Can you do that, Chris? Yeah, I think you could because you have those data in the summary table. I mean, the question is where to put it. In the same section, in the bio, in the uh, hazard index yeah, section. Okay. If you can actually, I'm that not was. Sure, I'm not sure it's necessary. Okay, here's why I would say that it's not necessary because it seems to me the logic is evaluation of the exposure modeling seems to be very comparable <clears throat> with however we define comparable to the biomonitoring data. The advantage of the biomonitoring data for the hazard index is that you're actually representing you know, the true mixtures per person. And so with that, then we go in and do the hazard index. So then to go back and say, well, we could then go back and do it the old standard way. I don't know, it, it doesn't seem to fit the buildup of the, of the decisions and the advantages that we've argued up to that point. I mean, I, I guess I'm just thinking if you wanted not so much the total, but the, from the, if you wanted to do a source by source, yeah. But you've already got, I mean, you already got exposures from different sources. As a reviewer, I would think I would be left short by not having that done. Then why didn't you do that? Uh, from a reviewer, I would say, I don't know why you did this. I mean, I would say, what, 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 what advantage did that give you? Just I don't know. I mean, it's we, closure, completion. And if we did it by source, that would make it even more interesting. In fact, one of the viewers might come back and say, well, why didn't you do the hazard index by source since one of your charges is to look at how much hazard is being provided by children's toys compared to everything else? I, I see both, both points, but I, I would also be inclined to say that using population-based monitoring data is a richer data source to construct the hazard index stuff. Yes, I agree. So we should stick to that. But wouldn't it be a middle? On the other hand, the points you made, um, Michael and Paul, um, they emphasize the one advantage that stems from exposure med modeling, and that is you, you can be more specific about the sources. But to calculate hazard indices for specific sources is a little, uh, Dicey. shall we say, artificial. Huh? Dicey, because Dicey, we haven't yeah. got a way but to validate it. So the, here's it. my proposal for a middle way. It, we could have a paragraph, it uh, could be quite short, which um, outlines and emphasizes the complementarities in these two approaches, so the uh, the complementary, uh, sorry, the the, the advantages uh, and how they complement each other. So it could say that the biomonitoring is more holistic and has the advantage of 
uh, analyzing <laughs> individual data or, and then population based, but it does not get at specific sources, which is precisely what exposure modeling can do. And then with that in mind, we did an estimate on the yeah. hazard index for the so sources. I would, I would probably leave, leave that out, but then the one key bridging assumption or the, 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 the key point to point out then is that both exposure modeling and biomonitoring yield exposure estimates of, of comparable magnitude. Mm -hmm. You just don't know the sor which sources are important, although the exposure estimation suggests clearly that it's diet. That wraps the whole thing around into a knot. Because the, the exposure modeling, why would you do it? Well, it tells you that the biggest source will be diet, and that you can't get at all from the biomonitoring data. So in that hazard index paragraph, once we wrap it all up, yeah, that's, where, it, that's better than doing a I think that's better than doing a hazard assessment or hazard index for each for for the uh, for the model data. But we do bring it and wrap it around by saying in the end that these hazard indices are being dominated by diet. Okay, that's so fine. Recommending when we have that table that compares the the two approaches to have a paragraph that yes. kind of wraps it up. Yep. Okay. And I think that worked out really well. And who's going to write that? When I can write it once we get it, once we get all the knots tied on it. I just have to see what it looks like when we change, we move that over to that okay. section so that I don't say something that's silly when it's already in the section. It'll be right after this, but we have to wait until my friend here puts it in and okay. puts the table in, and then I can write that wraparound paragraph. Okay. It's not even a paragraph, it's a few sentences. But that's fine. I'll do that. And we can I volunteer. revisit that uh, this afternoon, hopefully. Yep. Okay. Am I clear about that? I will do that. You are cl still clear. Thank you. Are you happy with that, Chris? That yes. Yes, that sounds good. Okay. Um, Mike, should we break for lunch now and then come back and... and Tackle Chris's revision? Uh, sure. I think it's the perfect time to break. Um, when do you want to come back an hour? Yep, yep. an hour. Okay. 1.30. So okay. we'll be back in an hour.